Hello everybody, welcome to the kinematics tutorial. Now let's take a look at question 1. Consider a body having an acceleration of negative 2 meters per second squared. Is the body speeding up or slowing down and explain your reasons? Now take a look at the answers over here. Alright, you can pause the video to copy down the answers. What is the concept for this question? The concept for this question is if the velocity and acceleration are in the same direction, an object will speed up. So let's say there's a car here that's already traveling with a velocity v. If you also have an acceleration in the same direction, it will speed up. However, if you have a car that is traveling uh, forwards with a velocity v, but the acceleration is in the opposite direction, it will slow down. Now what happens to a car if the velocity is in one direction v, but the acceleration is in another direction, which is at right angle, to the velocity. In that case, the car will not speed up or slow down, it will actually turn. And finally, what happens if there's a car with velocity in one direction and the acceleration is in a direction that, at, at an angle? Now this car will actually turn and also slow down. So uh, you can see that the direction of the acceleration has one of two effects. You can speed it up, you can slow it down, or you can change the direction. So you can change the speed or the direction. So let's take a look once again at the answers. If the velocity is in a negative direction, the body will speed up because acceleration and velocity are in the same direction. If the velocity is positive and acceleration is negative, the body will slow down because acceleration and body velocity are in opposite direction. If the body is originally at rest, then of course, the body will speed up in the direction of the acceleration. Let's move on to question two. Now let's move on to question two. In question two, here are the key concepts. The key concept is the relationship between the displacement, velocity, and acceleration. You see, the gradient of the displacement time graph will give you the velocity time graph, and the gradient of the velocity time graph will give you acceleration. Now, the area under the acceleration time graph will not give you velocity, the area gives you the change in velocity. And likewise, the area under the velocity time graph will not give you displacement. The area under the velocity time graph gives you the change in the displacement. So with that understanding, let's take a look at question uh, 2. Now in question 2, the first question asks us, using the information from the graph, obtain the acceleration in section D. Now the acceleration in section D will simply be the gradient. So to, to obtain the gradient, what we'll do is that we'll take the y value here, 20, 30, right? And then we'll uh, compare it to the y value here. So the gradient will be 30 minus 15 over 20 minus 10. And so that would give us uh, 1.5. And so the acceleration will then be 1.5 meters per second squared. Right, let's move on to the next question. The next question uh, is the velocity at 17 seconds from the start. Now the velocity at 17 seconds from the start, we can tell that it's somewhere between 15 and 30. But exactly uh, where will it be? Now, we can actually use the gradient to help us okay, to obtain the velocity 17 seconds from the start. By putting this point over here, all right, uh, as 17 and v okay so now we can compare uh, two points we can compare the gradient here and we can compare the gradient here so we can say something like let's take a look at this gradient here this gradient here will be 30 minus v over 20 minus 17 it's equals to 30 uh, minus 15 over 20 minus 10. now this part we've worked out earlier is 1.5 so we know that 30 minus v over 20 minus 17 is equal to 1.5. Now we can work out the answer. To get V is equal to 25.5. Okay, so let's uh, transfer this uh, answer over here. Once again, how did we do it? Okay, we'll get uh, 30 minus V over 20 minus 17 will be the same gradient as 30 
minus 15 over 20 minus 10. And we know this is 1.5. Okay, so that means that 30 minus V over 20 minus 17 is equals to 1.5. V equals to 25.5. Now there is an alternative way to do this, which is using the uh, Suvat, uh, sorry, the kinematic equations where V equals to U plus AT. Now, so we want to find the final value of V, all right? And so the initial speed uh, that we started at will be 15, all right? And the final speed will be V. So you can write down the initial speed that we started at is 15. The acceleration is 1.5. Okay, what about the time, okay, for 17 seconds? Now, the time for 17 seconds is a increase of 7 seconds uh, from the 10, from the start, all right? So that would be, the time will be 7 seconds, which is 17 minus 10. Right, so this will also give us 25.5 meters per second. So, next, let's go on to uh, the displacement traveled in section B. Now, the concept to be used here is that the area of the under the VT graph gives you the change in the displacement. Okay, so, and the second concept we need to use here is that the trapezium area is the average of the parallel sides and the base. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the area in section B. Now, the area in section B gives you the change in the displacement, all right? So, to find this area, we'll get this height, which is 30, and this height, which is 15, and average it out and multiply it by the base, which is 10. So, the displacement travel in section B, okay? The displacement uh, is usually given... Uh, uh, variable s okay is equals to half of 30 plus 15 multiplied by the base which is 10 okay the answer will be 225 meters now just a side note did you notice that this is actually also a uniform uh, uh, acceleration uh, uh, equation from uniform acceleration All right half u plus v d now let's take a look at the next part the displacement travel in section E. The concept for this question is that the area under the x-axis is negative. So let's take a look at area E. Now E is also a trapezium, or rather it's a triangle with one of the sides being zero. So we can actually use the same equation where the displacement will be equals to half of the base, um, half of the average of the base multiplied by the height. So this will be half 0 plus minus 30 multiplied by 10. So this will give us negative 150 meters. Now notice that the area under the x-axis is considered to be negative. Okay, so in section uh, B part 1, we've got to describe the variation in velocity of the sections D and E. Now the variation of velocity uh, consists of two parts, okay? You must tell me about the direction of the velocity okay and the speed okay whether it's increasing or decreasing and you must tell me at the rate of change of the speed so there's three things to note for the description for the velocity number one is the direction number two of the speed whether it's changing or not and number three is the rate of change of the velocity so let's use this idea to talk about how we would describe the velocity uh, changing in section D. So in section D, the velocity is high and then after that velocity becomes zero and the velocity is positive. So we say that in section D, the velocity is in the positive direction. The speed is decreasing, okay, at a uniform rate, okay? Uh, then we put in some numbers from 30 meters per second to zero meters per second. All right, so give it a try for section E before you watch the next part of the video. Okay, I hope you have tried it. Now in section E, you can see that the velocity is decreasing or velocity is changing from zero to negative 30. So what we can say is that the velocity is in the negative direction. And then we can say that the speed is increasing at a uniform rate. 
okay, from 0 meters per second to 30 meters per second. All right, so you can see that the speed uh, is always a positive value because it's simply the magnitude of the velocity. Okay, so this is uh, B part 1. Now in B part 2, we must sketch, uh, we are given, uh, we are asked to sketch the displacement time graph of the car. We're going to sketch the displacement time graph of the car. This is going to be a pretty complicated problem, so let's take a look first. Okay, so over here the velocity is moving forward, so the car is moving forward. Okay, over here the car is moving forward and getting faster. Okay, over here the car is also moving forward and also quite fast. Over here the car is also moving forward but it's getting slower. And over here the car is stopped. It stopped. Now over here the car is moving backwards. It's moving backward but getting faster backwards. Okay, over here the car is moving backwards and it's quite fast. Right, moving backwards fast. Okay, so how are we going to uh, put all this on the displacement time graph? Okay, so for part A, the car starts at zero. All right, starts at zero. And it's already moving at 15. So what we're going to do is I'm going to draw a straight line over here. Sorry, we draw a straight line over here like that. Okay. Right, so this is going to be a straight line. And then after that, it's going to get faster. So from here, it's going to get faster like that. Okay, and then it's going to be moving very fast. So this is also a straight line. Okay, so apologies, my curve is not very nice. All right, this is also a straight line. Then after that, it's going to slow down. Uh, and then it's going to stop. So it's going to slow down and it's going to stop. Now when you stop, it means that the displacement is neither increasing nor decreasing and then after that it's going to go backwards faster okay it's going to go backwards faster this this graph should be symmetrical around here and then it's going to go backwards very fast all right so this is what it's going to look like okay so this will be the displacement time graph of the car so you can see that over here is moving forward over here is moving forward over here it's also moving forward but it's getting slower then over here is moving back then over here is moving back okay so this is the displacement what about the distance okay what about the distance so in terms of distance okay the distance is always uh, increasing because the distance traveled by the car keeps increasing so that's where the graph will diverge instead of going downwards the distance increases like this and this will be the distance traveled. Because the distance traveled doesn't take into account whether you're going forward or back. Okay, so this will be the distance uh, graph for the car. If you find that it's difficult to understand, just think about just think about whether the car is going forward or back. Okay, in terms of distance, whether the car goes forward or back, the distance is always increasing. Now let's take a look at the next uh, part over here. Acceleration is easier to do than displacement okay the concept for this graph is that acceleration is the gradient of the velocity time graph so over here we can see that the acceleration is zero over here the acceleration is positive because it's getting faster the car is getting faster over here the acceleration is zero over here okay it's getting slower so if it's getting slower the acceleration will be negative it's getting faster here but in the negative direction so the acceleration is negative and over here the acceleration is zero because the, the car is not getting faster or slow okay so how do we draw the acceleration uh, time graph right so uh, we have actually worked out some values uh, from before uh, we worked out some values from before so uh, we should mark down the values on the graph if we have them for part B, we worked out the acceleration is 1.5 meters per second squared. So we can put down here 1.5 and then we draw a line across for part B. Now, uh, we, um, 
we didn't work out the acceleration for this part okay but we can do so easily if we want to okay so over here the acceleration changes from uh, the velocity changes from 30 to minus 30 from a time of 30 to 50. so what we can do is minus 30 minus 30 over 50 minus 30 right so this gives you uh acceleration of negative 3 uh, meters per second squared so over here is negative 15 but for segments d and e is over here we put this as minus 3 okay so we draw a dotted line across to show that these two points are connected negative 3.0 all right so uh, we also need to draw in the acceleration here okay and the acceleration oops the acceleration here we need to draw it in then we draw this in then we draw this in and then we'll draw this in as well so make sure that the teacher can see your lines on the graph and that's the end of question two now let's take a look at question three a smooth ball is thrown vertically upwards with speed 10 meters per second on earth from a height above the ground it hits the ground after three seconds assume air resistance is negligible so what we need to do is sketch a velocity time graph in the axis below for the motion just after he has left the thrower's hand and uh, before uh, it hits the ground we don't really know where it started and we don't really know where it ended okay but we can draw the motion uh, like this so over here here's a person here's the ball the ball goes up and then it goes down so we notice a couple of things all right number one for kinematics question we are only concerned with after the ball leaves the hand and before the ball hits the ground so actually we can remove the person okay and so oops excuse me so this is the part of the problem that we are interested in next the vertical velocity at the top of the path is zero so the vertical velocity will be zero now over here we can see that the upwards path is longer uh, shorter and the downwards path is lo longer okay now initially for the ball we can see that over here is moving pretty fast and so over here the velocity is zero now over here is also moving at the same speed as before but now in the opposite direction downwards and over here is moving the fastest downwards okay so let's with this we are ready to draw a diagram of the motion okay and then once we draw right we'll it'll look like something like this okay right so this part that i've drawn right now is the ball going from here to here so this is a this is b this is c and this is d so over here this is a is going fast at part b all right the object has stopped and then at part c the object is going fast but in the opposite direction at part d is going fastest so we're going to continue this all the way down to part d okay and then of course once it hits the ground uh, the object will stop all right so now how are we going to give appropriate values okay for the velocities and the timings in order to obtain the timings uh for the the ball all right we have to use uh, a little bit of uh, mathematics and a little bit of uh, the kinematic equations now we are given a uh, data in the question that the speed upwards is 10 meters per second so this got to be 10 and then at a certain time all right which you don't know uh the ball has stopped so over here the speed is zero and then over here the ball is now moving down so the velocity is negative 10 all right but d we don't really know okay so let's try to find out the time uh, t which the ball stopped okay so we can use our kinematic equations v is equals to u plus a t to find out what time the ball stopped so when it stopped the velocity is zero the initial velocity is 10 the acceleration is negative 9.81 and the time that it traveled was t so using the equation we can find that t is equals to 1.02 seconds 
So over here, we can put down T is 1.02, all right? Now, what about uh, when it's at point C? Now, the time taken to travel from A to B will be the time that's taken to travel from B to C. So over here, this time will be twice of the previous, that's 2.04 seconds. Okay, and then what time does it hit the ground? It hits the ground at 3 seconds. That's given in the question. So this will be 3 seconds. And what speed would it be when it hits the ground? What's the velocity it will be when it hits the ground? Now for that, we can also use the same formula. B is equals to U plus AT. So we want to find out the velocity at point D. That will be 10 plus acceleration is minus 9.81. And the time travel, uh, the time that which we are looking at at point D is 3. Okay, so that will give us negative 19.4 meters per second. So we can put down here negative 19.4. So using the graph drawn in A, explain how you would obtain the height above the ground that the ball is drawn from. Now some students will say that um, the height above the ground should be given by this um, area, but that is the wrong area. The reason being that the height above the ground is this value, height above the ground. However, the area that I've shaded here is this value, the upwards trajectory of the ball only. Okay, so in order to find out what's the height above the ground, now the next question is using the graph drawn in A, explain how you will obtain the height above the ground that the ball is thrown from. Now let's take a look at this diagram over here. Right, the height above the ground is this uh, segment H that we want to get. Okay, it, this segment H can be obtained by taking the downwards uh, displacement and subtracting from the upwards displacement over here. But which areas are those? Okay, so if you look at the graph, this would be the upwards uh, displacement, and this would be the downwards okay uh, displacement. Right, so if we subtract the upwards dis uh, distance traveled from the downwards distance traveled, we should get the height above the ground. But if we look at the graph even more carefully, you can see that the upwards area over here is the same as the downwards area over here. The magnitudes are the same. So this means that this area over here will be equals to h. Okay, so once again, the logic is as follows. The height above the ground will be the downwards distance traveled, subtract the upwards distance traveled. Now the downwards distance traveled is this entire big triangle under the x-axis. And the upwards distance traveled is this area above the x-axis. Right. However, if you inspect this area over here, based on symmetry, this area is the same as this area. So that means that this area which is not subtracted is equal to h. So using the graph drawn in A, explain how you obtain the height above the ground that the ball is drawn from. So we'll say that the height above the ground is equal to the downwards okay, uh, distance travel okay, uh, minus the upwards uh, distance travel. Okay, and so that will be equal to the area under the graph from uh, 1.02 seconds to 3 seconds, subtract the area from 0 seconds to 1.02 seconds. You say, however, since the area from 0 seconds to 1.02 seconds is equal in magnitude, to the area from 1.02 seconds to 2.04 seconds, thus the height above the ground is given by the area under the graph from 2.04 seconds to 3 seconds. Okay, so this would be uh, the final answer. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at question 4. 
a ball is released from rest above a hard horizontal surface. Now, in order to do this question, we need to kind of sketch the ball, okay, and the ground, and how it moves, okay. So over here, it bounces, all right, it bounces up, and then after that, it bounces again, it bounces up again, and then after that, it carries on bouncing and bouncing. Okay, so at the start, it's over here, right? So that means that when the ball is dropped, this is where it starts at the top of its uh, trajectory, at the top of its path. And then when it bounces, its velocity changes from here to here immediately. That means that this point over here is when it bounces, right? So you notice that the bounce is very steep. All right, this line is very steep because it goes from one direction to another direction really quickly. Now this means that over here, this must also be a bounce. If this is a bounce, this must be the top of its path. Okay, so let's fill in the values over here. This, this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D. All right, so let's take a look. So this must be A, all right, the top. Then when it hits the ground, this must be B over here. Then when it reaches the top, this must be C over here. Then it hits the ground again, this must be D. Okay, so calculate the maximum height reached above the surface by the ball after the first bounce. This is the first bounce. And this is C, this is the top. So actually the question is asking for what is the height reached above the surface by the ball after the first bounce. That means between the bounce B and C. So let's take a look at the graph over here. Between the bounce B and the top C, what is the height reached by the ball? We know that the area under the graph is the change of displacement of the ball. So definitely the maximum height reached by the ball will be this area over here. Okay? Now, why is the graph so funny? How come how come the ball is going down? How come the ball is going down? But the velocity seems to be going up, increasing. That's because we must have defined downwards as positive. If we define downwards positive over here, then when it's going down faster, all right, then it will become a positive number. Well, in any case, let's take a look at how to calculate the height reached by the ground, uh, by the ball. Okay, so the, the height reached above the surface of the ball but after the first bounce would be the area under the graph, okay, from 1.0 to 1.8 seconds, all right? And we can actually uh, fill in the area over here, okay? Um, so that would be uh, half of the base, 1.8 minus 1.0, multiplied by the height, which is negative 8, okay? And uh, this is going to give us a negative 3.2 meters. So if the area under the graph is negative 3.2 meters, that means the height of the ball above the ground, okay, at the top after the first bounce will be equals to 3.2 meters. Okay, so refer to page 24 of your lecture notes. Compare the velocity time graph for a bouncing ball in the notes with the graph above. And state a difference between the two graphs, and what is the reason for this difference? Now, for your convenience, I've reproduced the two graphs uh, over here. This is from your lecture notes, and this is lo the lower one is from the tutorial. Okay, so the first thing we notice is that when the ball is released, the velocity goes negative instead. But over here, when the ball is released, the velocity becomes positive instead. So what we can say is that when the ball is released, okay, uh, the, uh, the lecture notes velocity, okay, becomes positive, while the tutorial graph, okay, velocity becomes negative. What, what does this indicate? What does this indicate? This indicates that the for the lecture graph is uh upwards uh sorry downwards is negative downwards is negative while for the 
a tutorial graph, okay, downwards is positive. Okay, so that's one, uh, that's one difference. Now, let's take a look at the other difference. Now, you notice that when the ball bounces over here, bounce. So when the ball bounces, this velocity and this velocity are the same. So when does the ball bounce again? The ball bounces here. This velocity and this velocity are the same. So the velocity after the bounce is always the same. But look at this over here. When it hits the ground, it bounces 10, becomes minus 8. So what happens is that when it's rushing towards the ground, the, the velocity is 10. When it bounces up, the velocity is minus 8. And then when it hits the ground again the next time, the velocity will be, min, uh, will be 8. But when it bounces up, the velocity is actually... Oops, sorry, I think you can't see. So let me repeat that. Now what this graph shows is that when the ball hits the ground for the first time, the velocity is 10. But then when it comes up, the velocity is minus 8. So there's some loss of speed. So when it hits the ground again, the velocity is 8. When it bounces up, the velocity, the new velocity is minus 5. Okay, so whereas for the lecture notes, the, the velocity is always the same whenever after hitting the ground. So what we can say is that for the lecture, the, for the lecture notes, the velocity of the ball immediately after the bounce is the same. Uh, uh, the speed of the ball immediately after the bounce is the same as the speed before the, uh, just before the bounce. Okay, this means, this indicates that for the lecture notes, there is no energy loss of uh, during the impact. Now for the tutorial graph, okay, the speed of the ball decreases after the bounce. This indicates that in the tutorial, okay, the energy is lost on impact. Okay, some energy of the ball is lost on impact. Okay, so this is the second thing that is uh, kind of different. It's kind of different. Now, you'll notice also that for the uh, lecture notes, all right, the time between the bounces appears to be quite consistent. This is the time between bounces. All right, the time between the bounce appears to be quite consistent. Whereas for the uh, tutorial, the time between the bounces appears to be getting shorter and shorter. Because over here, this is 1.0, this is 1.8, this is 2.6. So the total time between the bounce is 1.6 seconds. But for here, this is 2.6 and 3.1. That means the total time between the bounce should be about 1.0 seconds. Okay, so something else that we could write is that for uh, the lecture, Okay, the time between bounces is consistent, while for the tutorial graph, the time between the bounces decreases with each bounce. Now, this is because, all right, this, the, the reason for this is simple. For the tutorial, okay, the ball loses energy, some energy, with each bounce. So it will not reach, uh, so it will reach a lower height than before after each bounce. Okay, so if it reaches a lower height than before, thus the time to the next bounce will decrease. Okay? So this is uh, a simple explanation. So even a bouncing ball can have quite a lot of physics involved. All right, so this is the end of question four. Okay, let's take a look at question five. In question five, the key concept that we have to learn are called the 
Duval equations or equations of uniformly accelerated motion. Now please note that there are two conditions for these equations to be used. The first condition is that this equation only applies to motion in one direction along a straight line only. And number two, these equations can only be used if the acceleration is constant. Now let's take a look at the Suvat equations. There are actually four equations, S, S, V and V squared. But did you notice that each of these equations is missing one variable? All right. So S is missing, the first equation is missing V. So V does not appear at all in the equation. The second equation, acceleration does not appear in the second equation. The third equation, displacement does not appear. And the fourth equation, time does not appear. So the Suvat equations are so named because there are five uh, variables in the in the equations. The first one is the displacement, the final displacement. The second one is the initial speed, final speed, acceleration, and time. So step one will be to write down all the data for the question. Note that only three data points are required to solve the question. Then once that's done, we'll choose the equation that has the same missing variable. So let's take a look at the question over here. A stationary hot air balloon is 21 meters above the ground when the package is released from the balloon. Calculate the time taken for the package to fall to the ground. So over here, we have uh, 21 meters, all right, to falling, uh, falling down. Now, the first step that we should do for every question is the origin, okay, the original position of the object to be taken as zero, zero. Now, meaning that the object uh, starts here, this position here, this is the x and y axis, the displacement in the x direction and the displacement in the y direction over here is zero, zero. So after the object has fallen 21 meters, the displacement here should be 0 minus 21. Okay, so let's fill in all the numbers uh, that we have. I'll just copy down this uh, table over here. So the first thing we should fill in is that the displacement is negative 21. The next thing we should fill in is that the acceleration is negative 9.81. For all uh, uh, kinematic equations that are happening near the Earth, the acceleration is always taken in the downwards direction. Of course, you can always say that the, the positive is downwards, but I recommend not to do so. Now, remember, we need three uh, data points before we can solve the equation. All right. Um, we want to calculate the time for the package to fall to the ground. So this is the target. We want to have T inside. So what is the last data point? The last data point is that when the package is released from the balloon, the initial speed is equal to zero. So this is a hidden data. All right. So this is a hidden data. So the initial speed is zero. So now we have three equations, uh, sorry, three data points and we don't need a V. So we look for the equation that does not require a V. Missing V will be the first equation. So we can fill in S is equals to UT plus half AT squared. So we fill in negative 21 is equals to because u is 0, so this has no value over here. 0 plus half negative 9.81 v squared. All right, so we can work out the equation that t is equal to 2.07 seconds. Next, calculate the speed of the package just before it hits the ground. Now we can do the Suva equation uh, again. All right, now we have um, almost all the data points. So we can write negative 21, 0. We want to know the speed of the package just before it hits the ground and the time is 2.07 seconds. So when all the variables are available, we can use the simplest equation. The simplest equation will be V equals to U plus AT. All right, so V is what we want to find. Uh, U is zero, A is negative 9.81 and time is 2.07 seconds. So it turns out that the velocity will be equals to negative 20.3 meters per second. Now remember, velocity comprises uh, speed and direction. So the speed is always a positive value. The speed will be the magnitude of the velocity, which is 23.3 uh, 23, 23 meters per second. Now the hot air balloon is now traveling vertically upwards at a constant speed of 5 meters per second. 
When it's 30 meters above the ground, a second package is released from the balloon. So the hot air balloon and the package is now traveling upwards at 5 meters per second. Now when the package is released 30 meters from the ground, its path will not be just straight down like that. No, its path it will actually have some of its original velocity and so its path will go up and then down. Alright, so this is how the uh, object will actually move Okay, with a starting velocity of 5 meters per second. So the concept is this. An object launched from a moving vehicle will have an initial velocity. All right, a concept on object launch from a moving vehicle will have an initial velocity. So let's take a look. Remember the origin point over here is 0, 0. So the final point over here will be 0, negative 30. In negative 30. So likewise, when you fill in the equation, negative 30, initial speed 5, time taken for the second package to reach the ground, and acceleration negative 9.81. So once again, we don't have V, and the equation which does not have V in it is S equals to UT plus half AT squared. So we can fill in the values. Negative 30 is equals to 5D negative 4.905 D squared. So why do I use negative 4.905? Now, the value of half A appears very regularly. So uh, it's quite useful to uh, memorize this figure. So using a calculator, to solve this quadratic equation, we get uh, t is 3.03 .03 seconds or negative 2.02 seconds. We reject the negative timing. Uh, so that's the value of t. Calculate the speed of the second package just before it hits the ground. So uh, once again, this is a very simple uh, solution. We have minus 30, 15. We, don't, we want to know this. Then we have negative 9.81. And the time is 3.03. .03. So we can use the simplest equation, which is V equals to U plus AT. So that will be equal to 15. Uh, sorry, not 15, but 5. Uh -huh. So 5 minus 9.81 times 3.03. .03. And this will give us negative 24.8 meters per second. So the speed would be equal to 24.8 meters per second. Alright, so that's the end of question 5. Let's take a look at question 6. A cricketer ball throws a ball vertically upwards and catches it 3 seconds later. So neglecting air resistance, calculate the speed to which the ball left his hand. So we can fill in on a Suvat equation uh, some of the variables over here. A is negative 9.81, T is 3.0. We want to find out the speed which the ball left his hand, which is the initial uh, speed. Now, what is the hidden variable? Remember, we need three, three data points for the SUVAT to work. So, if we state that the initial position of the ball was 0, 0, then the final position of the ball is 0, 0, meaning that the ball's final displacement is also 0. So, we, don't, we have now have our, got our three data points, so we don't need V. So, we can look at the equation which doesn't have V. S equals to UT plus half AT squared. So now we can put in 0 is equal to u v plus half a t squared. So solving this, we get u is equal to 15 meters per second. Next, calculate the maximum height that the ball rose to. Now we can't use the same stupak because the, if you draw the second uh, path, you'll find that the shape of the second path is not the same as uh, the first one. So we actually have to redo the entire uh, table again. We can't reuse the table. So now we're going to calculate the maximum height that the ball rose to. This height will be s. So s is the variable we want to find. Now the u is obtained from the previous part. Okay. So now we have two variables. What is the third hidden variable? Now the third hidden variable is that when the height is maximum, v is equal to 0. So this is the third hidden variable over here. We don't need the time. So we'll choose an equation that does not have time. It will be v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as. So let's fill in the values. 0 is equal to 15 squared plus 2 times of negative 9.81 and s. 
So S over here will be 11 meters. So that's how to do uh, this question.